Three Good morning. <laughs> My name is Eric Salcedo. I'm the National Field Director for Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote. We're a national uh, nonprofit organization that partners with local communities to do voter registration, voter education, GOTV. That's not go watch TV, that's go get out the vote. <laughs> And the important, I think the most important pillar, election protection, making sure that our voters are able to exercise their right when they go vote on election today. Uh, I have the distinct honor of moderating our panel with um, our guests. Hold on, I have, Christine said you better make sure you have all your notes, so. <laughs> all right, that's not it. Um, <laughs> All right, no more jokes. Um, so as we said earlier, we are 19 days away from National Voter Registration Day. That is September 25th. And uh, depending on how you uh, time your clock, we are 61 or 60 days away from Election Day, November 8th. So the question is, what the heck are we doing here, right? Uh, oh, sorry. My kids are all mixed up. Anyway, um, what are we doing here? We're here because we need to start talking about, one, what are our best practices in doing this work? Because the end game isn't just the 2018 election, right? What we do is we are base building and building community. So we don't just go by one cycle election calendar. We are looking down the road. We are looking to 2020, 2022, 2024, right? Uh, on our road tour during our Norman Wyman at Leadership Institute trainings, we talk about progress towards parity. How are we going to bridge the gap when it comes to voter registration rates, when it comes to voter turnout and vote share? So with that, I have, the again, the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing our panelists. Oh, before I do that, I just want to make a plug for National Voter Registration Day, September 25th. API vote, we are on the steering committee. And if you haven't signed up, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you signed up to be a local partner. There's still time to get a lot of the awesome local swag. It's in, available in many languages and in English. You get stickers, buttons. It's a great way to advertise the event on that Tuesday, September 25th. You can go to api.vote backslash nvrd2018 and register to be a partner through API Vote. And that'll be one of our conversation questions. What are, what are you guys doing for National Voter Registration Day? But first, let me introduce, starting from my right, we have Karuna Ramachandra, the Deputy Director of Advancing Justice Atlanta. Uh, we have Victoria Wynn, Vice President, Center for Pan-Asian Community Services in Atlanta. To my left, Robin Yee, Lead Political Organizer for Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, also known as APANU. Kajua Ba, co-executive director now of Freedom Inc. up in Madison, Wisconsin, for you non-Midwest folks. <laughs> and to the left, uh, Vita Lin, executive director, Asian Community Development Council in Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> See, any good panel member comes with their own entourage and sharing section. <laughs> So thank you all for uh, sitting with us. Oh, sorry, I'm getting my cards all over the place. So my opening question. Well, first off, well, let's run through the panel real quick. What are you doing for National Voter Registration? What's your organization doing? Because that's coming up really quickly. It'll give some ideas for uh, folks in the audience uh, what's going on. Let's just go down the road real quick. Okay, so for National Voter Registration Day, we're actually really focusing on college campuses this, this year. So we're hitting the local community colleges, some of the larger universities, and then we're working along with the state table that's having a large event, presser, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so for CPACs, we, that's 15 days before our voter registration deadline. So we're kicking it up. Uh, we're going to be in high schools. Um, so last year, in like a matter of two, three hours, we got 600 plus voter registrations. Um, and so this year, our goal is about 1,000. And we're hitting up all the high schools in the main API uh, locations. Uh, Hello? Uh, Apana is going to also be pre-registering 16-year-olds and above at all the high schools, the college campuses, and we'll also be um, hosting a full day of uh, campus shifts from our offices. 
and then also uh, registering newly naturalized citizens um, in the Portland downtown office. So um, we'll be doing a lot of stuff up, up until that day. Um, throughout Wisconsin, there's many, many cultural gatherings. And so we've been going out in teams and just tabling and doing all of that. Um, for ACDC in Las Vegas, in 2016, we were at Seafood City, which is one of the largest Filipino um, grocery store. And we got all the coalition partners together and did voter registration register about 100 people that day. This year, in 26, uh, 2018, Seafood City had expanded to four locations. So we're going to be in all four locations with our coalition partner and doing voter registration there. Awesome. That's so exciting. Thank you so much. Um, just so everyone knows, this is more of a conversation than like a, like a televised panel. So I'm going to you know, invite everyone to uh, kind of converse with one another and the audience will have a chance to ask questions and then we're going to do our own tabletop exercise as well. But my, my first question for the entire panel, if you can jump, jump in whoever wants to go first, is um, what, what aspect of your civic engagement program is, is going well? You know, what, like where, where are you really succeeding in, in 2018, you feel like? You've made the greatest strides. Um, in 2018, we're really excited about our um, GOTV. Um, so the voter engagement piece is from 2016, where we saw the Asian American vote really triple. Um, and then now flash forward to 2018, where we see that the voter turnout is you know, 137% uh, higher for those voters who have been contacted among the general, uh, as opposed to the general AAPI population. So we're really seeing that our efforts at the door canvas are really effective, and I think part of that is really working with the coalition and having very targeted canvas um, and being very specific within our communities and really getting our um, coalition partners the resources they need. So the perks of having two co-conveners in Georgia. Um, so uh, we also have an incredible coalition of about 28 organizations, including Advancing Justice and CPACs, uh, multiracial, multi-ethnic, multilingual groups. Um, we're able to really spread out the work, right? Instead of having two organizations take on um, all the get out to vote, um, you know, uh, voter engagement work, we're able to spread it out, um, do a lot more work um, in areas that we're not able to reach ourselves. Um, and we made some really incredible investments in 2016 and 17 through um, the support from culture. And so now these groups are actually building and leading their own within their own communities. Excellent, excellent. We're just so, going down the line. Oh yeah, just or if you have one, jump or in. Want to jump in? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think for Wisconsin, um, it is a state. I have to give you a little background and then uh, share with you like the success that we've had. So in Wisconsin, up until uh, Coulter Foundation, like we really didn't have an investment, a strategic investment in like building any kind of civic engagement within API communities. And in Wisconsin, the Hmong population is the largest population. And so um, when we got into this game, we really didn't know uh, what we needed to do. And so it's been, it's been just learning for the last two years. I'm really honored to be up here because I mean, you know, being fairly new, um, in the last two years, like really just learning and studying and figuring out what isn't working. But really taking like what uh, traditional civic engagement tools were doing and then like practicing those and failing and saying that doesn't actually work and trying to figure out what actually worked. And so this year, I think one of the things that we are most proud of is Sue's like, you got to work with the van, you got to work with state voices. And like trying to figure out how to do work in a predominantly like uh, white uh, state, uh, we have to do some stuff so of course we have to have a political conversation and that is like to, to be to have some clarity ab around how do home folks and white folks work together um, and once we figure that out then we're like okay the van actually doesn't work for us and so one of the biggest success that we had this year was we said we're gonna do the tr uh, we're gonna take civic engagement traditional tools and, and look at the van and see how the van has been working and how it, it hasn't been working and so one of the 
things that we are trying out in the state of Wisconsin is relational voter uh, uh, engagement. What that is, we just basically made up a list of all of our friends and families and everybody that would come through to all of our agencies. And we said, let's make those calls. Because what we were finding out is the van uh, names and list, we would call and maybe get like 15% contact or it would be the wrong number, or it wouldn't even be API folks. What we did when we did the relational uh, voter contact was, we would get like 50% um, con voter contact. And so it really like, changed how we were doing things throughout the state of Wisconsin. The other thing is, one of the successes that we were able to, to uh, witness was this last election, a couple weeks ago, they said it was the highest turn, um, uh, turnout rate for people of color. And I have to say, within our city, uh, when they said that, I mean, we made like hundreds of calls to people, and people are out like driving uh, people to uh, to vote, and we were getting people to go in groups because people were afraid to go. And so I think it's just like changing the game up, and and it doesn't work everywhere, but in the Midwest, like we we had to find something that was different from the East Coast and West Coast, and so we're trying things out, and I, I think that's what um, I'm most proud about in our work. Awesome. And, and, and just a translation part. So for those that don't know, Van, it's not Sue Van or Dennis Van. It's a Van, the Voter Activation Network. It's the, the electronic voter file that we all use. And um, for those other national consultants, are like, Eric, how are you learning? And they're not going to do supplement. They're augmenting the data in the Van by using this, right? So And uh, the, the APIs in Van are still going to get our normal uh, you know, voter contact treatment. So thank you so much. Uh -huh. So I agree. We're, we're very new at this. Too. We've only been around for about two years in doing voter registration. Um, thank you for Sue and, and the Coto Foundation. What they did was they taught us in 2016 what we can do in Nevada. Because in Nevada, we've been so silent. Our <coughs> community hasn't come out and vote or register, right? So we're really proud this year. And um, we were tasked by other funders because of, uh, of Sue to fund us to do more voter registration. So in March, we were tasked to do 5,000 registered voters from March uh, 5th through October the 9th. So it's a six-month project, right? <coughs> so within two months, we reached our 5,000 goal. So the funders are very happy with us and say, hey, can you do 10,000? <coughs> Register 10,000 people. I said, okay, let's go back to the drawing board. Got together with my directors and... Uh, the civil engagement and got together with the team and said, hey, can we reach 10,000? And they all said, yes. <clears throat> so by um, within two months again, by March, uh, by August 14, we reached 10,000 registered voters. <clears throat> so <laughs> you said, oh, you did it within, you know, before October the Nine, you still have a couple of months. Let's raise, make, let's raise it up to 13,000. So as for today, we're over 11,200. So I think we're going to reach, reach our goal of 13,000 voters. What did you say when you started? When I started to... I think you have to get that. The story about how we started. So, so in 2016, I, so I started the... Um, ACDC in 2015 with a budget of 32000 So when Sue came to meet us in 2016, our budget went over to almost under 400000 And now we're over one point, well, over a million dollars in funding to help us do civil engagement work. And the only way you can get funding from other groups is when you reach, reach those numbers, you make the difference. And now that you register the vote that we need to register, the next thing you have to do is to get out the vote. So when Sue came to us and said, hey, you need to kind of get the get people, you register them, but let's get them out to vote. So we put in a very heavy, heavy canvassing. We're going to do 22,000 door knocking, two, two rounds, phone banking, and so forth. So yes, we're going to continue the work. Great. Well, that's hard to top, but uh, you know, in Oregon, we are one of the we vote by mail exclusively. So for 20 days, voters have the ballot in their mailbox or 
in their hands. So what we uh, were really successful in this year is we've actually already had two elections in 2018 alone, a special election in January, our primaries in May. So we were able to test multilingual phone banking, um, but really emphasizing on calling folks early on, so like that first week that they get it right in their mailbox, literally in language, telling them, go to your mailbox, look for the envelope that looks like this, right? Open it up now. This might be the first time you've seen a ballot, so we would walk them through it. We'd have copies of, or like sample ballots um, in our offices, so the phone bankers would like be looking at the thing that they're searching for and then walking them through that, and those would turn into concrete votes. Some folks even came into our offices like an hour after we called them to turn it in, right, or to get a stamp to put in the post office. So uh, for the January special election, it was about healthcare. We set up um, nine straight days of phone banks in the evenings, and we filled over 200 shifts um, in that week alone. And that was like January, it's not a great time in Oregon. It's raining for like five weeks straight. Um, so it was, it was really impressive to see that kind of turnout and that excitement. Um, two questions uh, for you, Robin, regarding um, voter registration and um, GOTV or mail, mail, MOTV, I guess, I don't know, sure. mail to vote. Um, AVR, automatic voter registration in Oregon. Like, how does it work there? Because AVR is such a huge umbrella. What, how, how is it, uh, what's it defined in, in, in Oregon? Yeah, so AVR is automatic voter registration. Oregon was the first state to implement it uh, starting 2016. We passed in 2015. Uh, 13 states in the District of Columbia have followed. Um, and I think there's a movement in a lot of other states to make it so that anytime, or in Oregon at least, anytime someone interacts with the DMV, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, they're automatically registered unless they opt out. So it's like a default opt-in, right? And that's really expanded the electorate. That's added, um, even since November 2016, it's already added 250,000 more Oregon voters, uh, which is awesome. Many of them Californians who are moving to Oregon, but you know that's a separate issue. Um, we, but we know that, uh, so that it's been great because uh, we encounter more people saying, I'm already registered, which is great. But that doesn't mean that they're voters, right? They don't have the voting habit. Um, it's not like campaigns have adjusted to start investing money into talking to people that they have zero idea about, right? They're still gonna go back to the people that have already voted, um, who, and, but right now, non-affiliated voters, so uh, our, our people who don't choose a party are um, the largest single group voting block in Oregon, and then, um, but a lot of these folks who came directly from like the DMV registration, these folks turn out at like very, very, very low levels. So we still don't know enough about them, um, but they can swing elections because they're like pretty evenly dispersed throughout the state. So they can make a difference in every single district. So it's a strategy, but there's not that long-term vision, at least from campaigns. <clears throat> and, and for mail-in ballots, is it tricky getting college students? Because when I was an undergrad, many decades ago, uh, you know, you relied on the mailbox for everything, right? Checks from mom, you know, money, you know. But now it's like just kind of like junk mail, right? Because they don't, you, you don't get anything in the mail anymore. So, except for the mail-in ballot, right? So how does that work? Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's tough because a lot of the times, you know, you're at, let's say you're uh, downstate at the university, and you, but your ballot is up in Portland, right? or in, in your parents' home. So that does present a difficulty in uh, Multnomah County, which is where Portland seated. They've actually opened, we've worked really uh, closely with the elections office because the one wrap, um, loophole in the voting system is like if you physically go to the elections office, you can cast a ballot there. So we've actually shuttled people there before or that's why we call early and enough so that you can get a replacement ballot. You just call the office, say, oh, it was sent to the wrong place. Can you please redistribute another one to like my dorm room, for instance. So. Um, knowing that that is a problem, we've been trying to address it, but um, with the mail-in system, you also have to like update your address when they start mailing it. So that presents another difficulty, whereas some states have same-day registration, so you can just walk in no matter where you live. So that's one of the minor drawbacks of, of mail-in voting. But you should encourage your state to go exclusively by mail, since we do early voting by mail anyway. Um, it's a really great system. Great. Um, I want to go back to Atlanta, and uh, you, you were mentioning uh, your your coalition partners. Um, for those that don't know, um, Gwinnett County is a uh, 287G program county. Raise your hand if you if you have a 287G program or you know what that is. Wait, know so, what it is or have, have one or know what it is? Either one. Okay, a handful of folks. Um, 
Why don't you tell us what 287G is and how that has impacted, you know, your civic engagement efforts and your coalition building? Yeah. Um, so 287G is the contract that local um, and countywide and statewide <laughs> uh, municipalities can take up with ICE. So essentially what this does is formalizes collusion with Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, and mandates um, local police and even the sheriffs to uh, to hold individuals for a certain period of time. Sometimes it's 48 hours, sometimes 72 hours until ICE and, uh, you know, officials can come and collect folks. So essentially what it is, is it, um, it, it intensifies the deportation, the detention and deportation pipeline. And so in Georgia, we have six contracts across the state. And in Gwinnett County, as you mentioned, um, Gwinnett County is actually one of the most quote unquote productive 287G relationships or contracts in the entire country. Um, and so it's a huge issue of concern um, to voters and non voters alike. <laughs> um, it's something that's really helped galvanize, um, you know, that, that passion and will of our coalition. Um, to be honest, you know, our coalition members, and we talk about this a lot, um, deal with a lot, of, and we all face this with what we call voter apathy, right, within our communities. And how can we really move our communities from registering to going out to vote to then, you know, becoming advocates, becoming champions in the community um, and mobilizing year-round? And so our work in Gwinnett County, um, particularly with the campaign to get ICE out of Gwinnett County, has really helped. Um, and I think a piece of it too is um, for us as a coalition, as co coalition partners, we really value the solidarity piece. And I think that's something that makes our coalition um, special as well, is that we have that solidarity among our coalition partners, among API communities, with um, African immigrant communities, Latinx communities. Um, and we're working really in unison in these, these issues that affect all of us. Um, and so that's, I think, something that's um, really impacted all of us. And it's very heartbreaking. Um, uh, and it's something that it transcends voting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's, really, it's a, I think, a galvanizing issue, like you said. And um, uh, it really just shows that Atlanta is on, on the front lines when we talk about um, uh, immigration enforcement in this country. And, uh, you know, when you see hashtag abolish ICE, it, it, it means something different in Atlanta than it does for the rest of us, right? Um, thank you so much. Uh, going back to Vita in Las Vegas, because you talked about how you ramped up going from 5,000 to 10,000 to 13,000, which is, and I know, which is great, but, you know, for someone like me, I'm always like, ah, why couldn't we just start off at 10,000 and just raise it once, because now it looks like I set the bar too low, or we always, you know, because this isn't the first time Vita has uh, exceeded voter registration expectations in a, in a, in a cycle, because you've done it, like, every year, right? So what is your secret in being able to, you know, increase capacity in, you know, such a short time frame? Because um, it, it, it amazes me. I always think that you have, like, your, you have a 5,000 plan, and then when you know more, you know, more, more additional resources coming in, then you can... You know, you know, activate Plan B. And well, is it is additional resources? Resources help us to get people, to train people, to bring people on board, right? So I think what's important, what we did this year, I think the reason why we started with five thousand, we raised up. So we brought a lot of youth into our organization, and when you bring youth into your organization, not only to register them, but actually to bring them on board to register other. So I have a couple of stories. I have one, one student that was uh, in college. He came to the United, uh, United States when he was a teenager. He's Thai. And his English is not that great. And he's kind of shy when he started out with us, right? But we encourage him and say, hey, you're at, the, you know, you're at the community college. Register in your area, in your college, the people that you go to school with, right? Get them on board. So this really shy person 
I call him T because his name is too long, if you know Thai. Um, <laughs> he went out there and he started registering people, but he felt really good because he's going to vote for the first time himself. And for him to be able to get other people to vote and get them engaged, that was very empowering, right? But one another story that I have is a 17-year-old is a who just turned 18 recently that came from a very broken family, abusive family. And so when we reach the 10,000 goal, or the 5,000 goal, the 10,000 goal, we have a celebration. And we make, you know, we kind of do this like, hey, this person, you know, so-and-so, you did the highest number, or the, uh, the best numbers, and so forth. And we recognize these young kids. It moves them. They, if they cry. I was so shocked. And he goes, no one ever paid attention to us before. No one ever told me that was good enough. When we do voter registration, we're registering people to let them know that you have a voice, that you mean something. And until we can get our staff or the people that's going out there to believe in that, that what they're doing is good work. And it's not, I know it's hard, but if you believe in what you do and how we can change our community to get them out to vote, and we're reaching out to those who's never been reached before, who's never been asked to say, your voice matter, you matter. So let's register you. And when you have your staff and everybody believing that and coming and competing against themselves and saying, hey, what did I, what did you do today? I brought in 35 application today, voter forms, right? And Daisy would say, I brought in 52. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're competing against themselves, but it's family watching each other's back. That makes a difference. So every week we have a bulletin and we put the person's name who did the most of that week. And we average 92 forms that they bring every week. And so I go on, and, and we have some amazing staff. And you ask me how I reach the numbers? Because we got the staffs. We got people who believe and know what we're doing. And that's when I go to work on Sunday, sometimes to see what's going on, and my staffs are there. It was Labor Day weekend on, on Monday. I said, what are you guys doing on Sunday? And then they have, you know, she goes, we got work to do. We got less than 60 something days before before the election, we need to do some lot of work on how to get everything together. They come on their own time, they're driven, they're committed, and that's what we, I think that's what makes it work as well. Uh, you know, empowering members, empowering volunteers, and, and co-workers, and, and strangers, right? New people, bringing them into the fold, I think is, is key ingredient to all your coalitions. Um, I, I want to ask Kajwa and, 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 and Robin, like, what are you doing to uh, empower, you know, empower new people and young people and turn voters into active members? So I think this is really interesting that Vita and I are up here because we have very different strategies. Um, and I think that it's wonderful to, to know that we can be a cohort where, you know, you're turning out numbers and that's excellent. And then you can have a program like mine that is stabilizing a community. Um, it is about building the capacity of a community. It is about building um, leaders and creating uh, people power, community power, not only through voting, but through like any way anybody can get engaged. So when you work with people who aren't able to vote, how are they going to be civically engaged? And I think that like Freedom Inc. has, um, or Wisconsin has a really good example. And you already know from Karthik's uh, data that Hmong people and Khmer people are, will hit the streets before any of you. So <laughs> with that said, like it's really about like when you can't vote, how else can you engage? So when young people can't vote, how can you engage them in making policy changes? When people who are undocumented or people for whatever reasons are not cannot be naturalized citizens, how can they civically engage? And so I think that Freedom Inc.'s um, way of like, if we don't turn out 10,000 registrants, how do we turn out 10,000 people who are impacted and can move community? And so this is one of the strengths that I think uh, we really uh, hone in on is like, how do you build people People so that they can lead? How do you get them to understand like local elections even when they can't vote? 
so that they can also make a change. Um, and so these are some of the things that we've been doing. How do you build somebody who comes in as a, a, a canvasser or who comes in just to do phone banking and now they have all of the capacities to get a job anywhere else? Um, how are we building the capacities of these organizations that we uh, grant to so that they're not around just be, uh, until election time or they're not around just until they get these numbers, but that they, they stay around because their communities need them? Um, how are you building the workforce? Um, now with all of our grantees, each one of them is um, uh, in the process of getting a full-time CE position. Like that would have never happened. But for them to understand like long-term sustainability in this movement um, and I, I feel like you know that's our strength and it's amazing that like we we do different work but we're both in the same movement right yeah for us I think and for a lot of organizations we know that voter registration is is just like the hook right it's to start the conversation you should always be organizing every chance you get so you get like 20 seconds as they fill out that form you can start floating other things that might pique their interest, right? Talking to them about issues that, uh, you know, you're talking to students, issues that young people, students care about, right? Hook them on values and then bring them in. Um, you know, so for, for that, it's, it's, it's easy to message and you're able to uh, use your position as a community-based organization to say, you know, elections, campaigns will are, want your vote, but we want your relationship, right? We want um, your values, we want to develop you. Um, and it's, you know, you voter registration, uh, at least in Oregon, uh, it's a well-received thing. People allow you to enter space um, easier, and then you can start building relationships. So, you know, Apata also has a 501c4, but C3 uh, spaces are, like, schools are very, very open to doing voter registration workshops, right? Um, gathering people and uh, gi uh, giving them skills, and then from there, um, you really build that relationship. Excellent. Um, how are we doing on time? Julie, do I have a couple more minutes before Q&A? Ten, Ten minutes before Q&A? Sweet. All right. Well, oh, no, no, um, no. Actually, that includes Q&A. Oh, that includes. All right. So I'm going to. Before we go to Q&A, I just want to. Uh, you could answer. Choose to answer this question if you if you feel like mm -hmm. it. Um, then we'll open up the the uh, questions for our audience. Um, for those, the, for other members in the audience, or those who um, wish to be up here next time, or if you can travel back in time in a TARDIS, right, um, and talk to your <laughs> former self, like what 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 advice or recommendation would you give to yourself or to so, to um, around this work? Around this work, like what like what what is like you know if you like oh I wish I knew this then or you know like that would have really helped. Sorry, that wasn't a prep question. I was like, oh. I think the point is to talk about CPAC as a social service organization because many people don't think that a healthcare clinic or social service yeah. can do civic engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you heard, but um, from Sue up here, um, but CPACs is a social service and a community health center. And so people don't often expect us to do this type of work where, you know, we're either, um, you know, the back end or, uh, doing voter engagement directly. Um, and so that's something that we've always um, included in our work, you know, at the front line, at our health center, or at the front desk at our, at our um, community center, or when our client comes in and they're applying for Medicaid, for example, or they're asking about interpretation translation services. Um, and so all of our staff are trained. Um, so we have staff meetings where we uh, train them, and that's something that um, for us is a best practice because we get everyone involved. You know, our civic engagement goals um, is something that's not unique to just our advocacy department, but it's the goal for the whole entire agency. Uh, so we have our youth that will take on our phone banking and canvassing. Um, so you're talking about you know, high school and college students doing this work, right? And really spreading it out. Um, and then also helping to inform us on how to do the digital campaigns. So I'm a millennial, but there are certain things that high school students right, you know, identify with that maybe we're just kind of out of the loop on. Um, so just reaching out to those high school students um, and having all of that kind of in one space is really nice for us. And to have 3,600 clients just come through our doors Right, and having that base just already there um, is, is really incredible for us. And then partnering with Amazing Justice, who's giving us ideas and, and um, opportunities to feed those you know community um, leaders 
and some of our grantees and some of the work around either the 287G or some of the sign-on letters or just some of the, the rallies that Advancing Justice does. And so we share that internally in our, our network. But um, if you haven't touched or reached out to your local social service entity, you should definitely do that because we have a lot of capacity in-house. It may take a little of convincing to figure out what that's going to look like if they haven't done some engagement. But I guarantee that uh, you know the investment is going to pay, pay in, in, in many folds. Okay, so... Um, we're cutting out the audience Q&A. Sorry. But that just means I get to ask well, one or two more questions. Um, so while you ruminate on the TARDIS time travel question I asked, I have another follow-up question for Atlanta. Because you are the, one of, the, uh, as, as Sue indicated, one of the few co-convener models. Um, how, how, that's, it, you know, in, on the, in theory and paper, it sounds good, but when, you know, um, you need to coordinate budgets and, and activities together, like, how does how does that work? Like, what what has been the secret to Atlanta's success? So, um, you know, at the beginning, we were trying to figure it all out, right? Uh, we have two different, very different agencies uh, with different, um, you know, workforce, you know, different process pieces. Um, so it took some time, to be honest with you, um, at the beginning. Um, but we found that it was just, um, we're even stronger because of it, um, because of all the works, all the special elections, all of the runoffs that we're having. You know, we're going through a lot of fatigue, but with, you know, with the support from our partners and our coalition, we're able to make it, right? And we still have, you know, the fight in us to continue, because um, we all have other, other pieces and other grants that we're also managing. Um, so it's nice to have um, you know, additional set of funds, and then an additional set of um, you know um, uh, people at the table when we're brainstorming ideas on, on which issues to target or uh, which communities to target. Um, so you know, if there's an opportunity for others to co-convene, I know it, at the very beginning it, it, it's gonna it's gonna be difficult to kind of talk to that process, but I think we're in a good place right now where we could um, you know we we have a pretty clear um, direction where we want to go, and um, you know we run into some things. So it's not all smooth sailing, um, but but, you know, we have uh, such an incredible partnership. Yeah, and just to echo that, I mean, I think it's, you know, um, it's a commitment, right, to have this relationship, um, just like any relationship, right? And we have those courageous conversations as well because we are coming from different um, organizational perspectives at times. And so the goal is to always uplift the coalition and our all of our national work. And so um, a, a really important part of that is understanding what those assets are that each of our organizations bring and tapping into them very strategically. Um, and so that's where we've done a lot better, I think, over the last year or so in planning. And just really, you know, like I said, having those courageous conversations, doing the asset mapping, and and making the time for planning because it is so crazy with all of the elections and the and the runoffs and and in Georgia it's it's a very you know just like we have in many other states but we constantly feel the attacks constant attacks <laughs> and so it's hard to to um, come out of panic mode um, but what we've been trying to do is really force ourselves to come out of panic mode really plan think strategically and. I think that our coalition partners are feeling um, feeling more supported because of that. And we're working better to create the space for them to really bring their leadership and their vision and their passion to the table. Um, and like what was said before, is really like now moving forward, um, it's to see how you know they can need this funding from us, you know, from Colt, from Suvan <laughs> directly, you know, um, less and less that they're actually going for their own funding, um, that they can be independent um, entities, and that's really the ultimate goal in terms of capacity building as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so unless, any quick thoughts on what you would tell your former selves, like, w or what you wish you knew? I wouldn't change a thing. All right. <laughs> it, it's not so much that, but I just want to say that, um, you know, uh, I think that this is not an, it's an unlikely relationship that you would think um, civic engagement work, like civic engagement work can exist and can uh, be intentionally uh, 
you can intentionally fund social justice organizations. You can intentionally fund uh, Southeast Asian organizations, queer organizations, poor folks, and we can make a difference. And I think that if there's anything to, to not to tell myself, but funders, that this is actually the place to put your money. Because when those who are most marginalized can, can uh, create power, uh, everybody else wins. And so if there's a message for anybody, that would be the message. Do you want to try to follow that? No. <laughs> well, I would say, yeah, with the, you should be ready to like escalate your dreams at any moment, right? When you asked about scaling up, like you don't, you never know when a uh, student will walk in and say, "Hey, we want to fund you," right? But so be able to think through that, right? Um, and and be ready to 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 dream big because the moment will call for it eventually. Yeah, dare to dream. I love it. Dream big and escalate. All right. So I want to thank our panelists, Vita, Kajra, Robin, Victoria. Karuna, sorry, I'm like tired. All right, um, thank you so much. Um, we are.